We all know that if we're rolling dice, we expect to get a uniform distribution. So with a six-sided die like this, we expect that the values 1 through 6 will come up about equally often. And of course, dice can have all sorts of different numbers of sides, as those of you who play game, games with odd-shaped dice will know. So in this uh, Python notebook, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by importing some stuff the way we usually do. And then we'll get some random numbers. And we'd like to see if we can simulate dice throws. So I've got a, an array of X here, and I'm going to go 0 to 100. So I'm going to do this 100 times. And I'm going to try to get a dice roll as the integer value of a random number. Now, this npRandom.rand returns a value between 0 and 1. So if I multiply it by a number a little bit smaller than 6, I'll get a number that is running between 0 and not quite 6. If I add 1, I'll get a number that's going between 1 and not quite 7. So if I take an integer value of that, I should get numbers that go from 1 to 6. And when I print them out, sure enough, so I do. That looks like a collection of relatively random numbers going from 1 to 6. We can't tell that by looking at them really, but we could test that a little bit later. Now, to provide a little more general possibility, I'm going to define a function here called dice and it'll take the argument sides. I'm going to use that random number thing again, multiply it times sides. I'm going to take sides and make it just a tiny bit smaller than the round number that I gave it, so that this is exactly the same sort of thing, the 5.99 times the random number plus 1, except that sides can now be a variable. So if I run that, for instance, if I roll a 27-sided die, I'm not sure I could find one, but we could try it out, I get 23 as an output. If I try it again, 22, that doesn't seem random. Try it again, I get 4. I guess if I did it enough times, it would probably be random. So if I pull all of that together and draw a histogram, I can plot out what's going on with a lot of dice throws. So if I take what's this, 100,000 dice rolls for my simulation. I'll set up X as having 100,000 variables in it, and our count array, this C, is going to have just a, a few more spaces than there are sides on the die, so that we can use the index, uh, the, the result of the dice roll, to index into C and count up how many of each roll we got. Then I'm going to go through as many times as n is. I'll get a value returned from dice. I'll put it in my x array and I'll add it to my count, which started off at zero here. Then I'll print out a few of them just to make sure that they're doing what I expect them to do. And I'll print out the count array so that I can see if it looks like it's uniform. And then I'm going to generate a histogram here and show that plot. So run that and I get a bunch of looks like random values but much more convincing are I look at these numbers and they're all about 16,700 not too far off so it looks like I'm getting fairly random numbers there and if I look at the histogram the histogram shows around 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 but nothing in between so if I tried that with uh, 27 instead of 6, let's see what happens. Oh, I got a whole lot of discrete values again spread out in the histogram. So it's doing what I expected it to do. It's generating relatively uniform distributions. But what if I combine them together? What if I rolled more than one die at a time? One die, I expect this uniform distribution. And if you go to this link, there's a whole lot of theory about the behavior of combinations of dice in, in probability theory, but we're going to look at this from a simulation standpoint because we want our statistics to be backed up by some measurements to make sure that they make sense in addition to being theoretically correct. 
So over here, they find that if you roll one die, it's uniform. But if you roll two dice, you're very unlikely to get either a 2 or a 12 compared to a 7. Lucky 7 in the middle there is the most probable result. And there's basically a triangular shape like that that results from rolling two dice. So it tapers off to the edges. If you roll three dice, it starts to look a little more curvy. And if you roll four dice, that's starting to look an awful lot like a Gaussian distribution. So combining random variables, even if they're uniformly distributed random variables, seems to be giving us something that looks like a Gaussian. But in our real world, we're not usually dealing with dice where you can only have one or two or three. Usually you can have a whole range of values, continuous range of values. So let's try that uh, on a continuous basis without rounding off to the nearest integer. So this time around, I'm going to do the same thing. I've got my uh, x, and I'm going to get some random numbers. They're going to get 10,000 of them. And I'm going to multiply by the number of sides, s, so that I'll go from 0.5 up to s plus 0.5, not rounded. And then I'll plot that his as a histogram and see what it looks like. Now, if I run that, I'm getting a whole lot of different bins because I still had s equal to 27 up here. Remember I said s equal to 27? Let's go back to 6 and see if we can generate the same results as the Wolfram result. So there's the relatively uniform distribution there. Now if I run this one, I'm getting a relatively uniform distribution over this same range from a half up to six and a half. So that's sort of like dice except continuous. Now if I get another set of 10,000 and call that Y, it should have the same characteristics as X. So now if I make R equal to X plus Y and plot a histogram of R, I get this triangle shape like in the Wolfram demonstration. It's tapering off to the edges. These values out here are much less likely than the ones in the middle. Numbers around 7 are still really lucky. Although, because now it's continuous, we don't have exactly 7. We have a range of values. Now, at this point, I'd like to introduce the idea of a probability density function. There's a probability associated with getting a result in the range 3 to 4, for example, that exists even before we start making trials. So although this histogram is plotting actually frequency, how many results we got, if we knew something about the process, we could predict what was likely to happen even before we did the test. So we were able to predict what was likely to happen following the same sort of approach that they did up here on the, on the Wolfram site. And we could predict what the probability was that we'd get a value in the range between 3 and 4. Not very likely. And if the results can lie anywhere in the range, then there's a continuous probability density function. We could get 3. We could get 3.14159. We could get pi, or something really close to pi anyway. So we've got a continuous range there. Uh, so we can talk about the probability density as identifying the probability for the results in a small region for any given trial. So if we've got a small region, if we th are looking for situations where our trial, where our test, where our sample lies between some result r minus a little tiny delta r over 2, and r plus a little tiny delta r over 2, then the probability of that happening divided by the size of the, the sample width, the, these delta r's, that's the density of the probability in that particular region. So if that's what a probability density function is, 
then we can expect, when we actually go to do the trial, that the number of counts that we'll get in any bin in the histogram depends on how wide the bin is. The wider the bin is, the more counts we should get in it. And the number of samples that we take. The bigger the number of samples we take, the more times we should count up those samples showing up in this particular bin. So we'd expect to wind up with our number being about equal to the probability density function times the width of the bin times the number of samples. And the Gaussian normal distribution is a probability density function. We've got that PDF function that we got before. And the function norm PDF returns those values for a Gaussian normal distribution uh, for a given mean and standard deviation. So we should be able to get uh, those values back and compare what we thought we should get in terms of number of counts to what we actually get. And that's what I'm going to do down here. So I'm going to take some random numbers and I'm going to multiply times s and add 0.5. So this is another example. This is like y and x. They're all the same. And I'm going to add that on to r. So I'm going to take r was x plus y. I'm now adding another die. So I'm getting up to three dice now. And I'm going to plot a histogram of r. And I'll use three times as many bins as there are sides on the dice. So going, going up to quite a, quite a good size number. And now I'll look at the histogram and I'll get a standard deviation of my sample collection and a mean of my sample collection. And I'll calculate the normal PDF over the bins variable of the histogram at that mean and standard deviation and multiply it by the width of the bins and the size of the sample number. So that's our, our PDF times bin width times the, the number of samples. And then I'll plot it out in red and see what I get. So when I run that, well now I'm back to having S equal to uh, equal to 6. So 3 times 6 goes up to about 18. And I did my sampling and I got this histogram in blue here. And when I compared a Gaussian normal probability distribution, it predicted that in here in the middle around 10 I should have got about 1200 samples. And sure enough I did. So I'd say that that red dotted line and that blue histogram are pretty close to each other. So even with as, as small a selection as three dice, we're starting to get something that looks an awful lot like a normal distribution. And that's really encouraging. So let's do it again. Let's take another die and add it onto R. We'll do the whole thing over again and we'll see what we get this time. And when we do it over again, oh, we're still getting something that's starting to look even more like a normal distribution. Now this time, you'll notice we don't have the counts over here. We've got a number that's less than one. So this time, instead of having the frequency We've put this in probability density terms. We're just using the PDF rather than the PDF times the bin width times the sample size. And in order to make that comparison directly with the PDF, we now have to make sure that we normalize the histogram. So this histogram has been normalized instead of being in counts, like 1,200 counts per bin, it's normalized so that it integrates out to one, just like a probability density function. So the moral of the story here is if we take 
any random variable, certainly a uniformly distributed random variable, and combine it with similarly uniformly distributed variables, we will tend to get this center peak. If we only have two, it'll be triangular like this. But the more random events we combine, the more we're going to get something that looks like a Gaussian distribution. So if we think that what's causing errors in our measurement is a whole lot of separate little random events, and that it's only these separate little random events when they're all combined together that gives us the noise on our data, then if we take a whole lot of little separate random events, we've got empirical proof right here that convinces me that a Gaussian distribution is a good representation of those many little random influences all combined together. So whenever we get many random influences giving us some noise and some difficulty in our measurements, Gaussian probability density function is going to be a good model for that noise and a good model for our uncertainty when we try to make estimates of how it all goes together.